Well, thank you very much, Commissioner, and I want to compliment uh, Commissioner Steele on Ma'am, did you have any follow-up that you wanted to take on that? I didn't want to cut into your time. If you've got a follow-on. I have actually so many questions yes. regarding this, and you know what? I'm so much interested in this. Organ harvesting is the awful things. It, this should stop, and this is not just in our com commission that we have to do it, but we have to do it all over the world. We have to stop CCP that dominating, that, you know, this is innocent people's organs that we really have to stop it. But I am just so frustrated. We've been known this issue for last 30 years. And we really have to do something more than just the hearing here, but the whole world, we have to work together to stop these horrific things. But thank you very much for giving me a little more time. Thanks, Commissioner Steele. Well, I first want to begin by thanking the panel. I want to thank Chairman Smith for leading what is absolutely a difficult conversation to have, but it's also an important conversation to have with the American people, one that too often we see in this bipartisan, bicameral uh, committee examining really the autocracy that is happening within the Chinese Communist Party today. For years, the U.S. has heard rumors of uh, the non-consensual transplant of human organs, otherwise known as organ harvesting, happening inside communist China. I can think of no act more heinous than taking a political prisoner, strapping them to a medical bed, and stealing their body parts from the inside out, and then launching those on a black market, or worse, the type of genetic analysis that we're talking about today. As you can see behind me, though, this is not a sci-fi movie. This is not written from a horror book. This is happening right now, today, in the most populous country in the world. And those who have repeatedly been persecuted, the Uyghurs, Fang Gong, and detainees, are oftentimes the subject of these heinous crimes, but they are not alone. It is expansive and it is routine throughout China. In 2006, independent reports alleged that tens of thousands of Hong Kong practitioners in the re-education through labor or rental detention facilities in China were victims of organ harvesting while they were still alive, but ultimately resulted in their deaths. Independent reports have also shown that nearly 25,000 Uyghurs are the victims of organ harvesting every single year. The time for the madness, the wholesale slaughter of a population has to stop particularly when it's used under the guise of doing science. So I applaud Chairman Smith for your leadership on this and for the difficult issues that you continue to bring forward with this commission, but most importantly for those who cannot defend themselves. So with our witnesses today, uh, I'd like to begin with uh, Ethan Gutman. You're a Chinese study fellow researcher. You've helped lead at the Victim of Communism Memorial Foundation. We'll begin with looking inward. Have Western corporations been complicit in the oppression of Uyghurs and Falun Group members here in the United States or been co-opted as agents of communist China in their endeavors? I, I, I'm going to, uh, I think Maya might have more to say on that question than me. So uh, I, I kind of hand it over to her. I just mentioned the Medtronic ECMO connection, which I think was significant right. uh, in Let's put it this way. Before ECMO, Medtronic ECMO got involved, uh, you could maybe do one or two organs from a human being and get away with it, uh, keep them fresh and get them to the right places. This is also something D.D. Kirsten Tatlow from the New York Times looked at very closely, the logistics of it. After ECMO, it became possible to harvest as many as four healthy organs from a single person. This suddenly turning a person from $100,000 into half a million or more for a foreign organ tourist. This is a dramatic difference. It became an incentive to harvest Falun Gong. It improved, it improved the chances that you'd make real money and, that, uh, and so forth. But, uh, I think after transplant technologies and medical, medical practice has been really progressed over the years, especially from 1990s and 2000s in organ transplantation. So the organ transplant only can develop if the organs do be accepted by the recipient 
And this is not just a DNA sequencing, but it's a lot of, you know, the blood test and HLA, they call it, specific antigen on the surface of the, of the cells and the organs as well that has to match with the donor. And now I think the technology is HLA typing, so how the matching donor and the recipient are a match and they can. And then after organ transplant care, like, you know, immunosuppressant drugs and all of those been developed really well and then transplanted organs can, uh, the first two years of up, up to 60% rejection rate before. And right now it's decreasing that rate because of the post-transplant care has been developed. The medical field has, you know, the scientists worked and, and so on. And I think the immunosuppressant drugs help. And the DNA sequencing just comes into that because the more of the genes can be sequenced, the less uh, differences between the donor and the recipient in the genome, the, the better the outcome that the, that organ will live not just 10 years, it can live in that organ, in, in that um, recipient for 20 to 30. So you really prolong the, uh, the organ, transplanted organ life in the recipient so by it's DNA clear sequencing. To say, Dr. Melitopov, that not only is China working to develop uh, an exploitation and long-term facilitation yes. of organs uh, for a profit, but the DNA sequencing on the front end to make sure that, that, that organ is capable Absolutely. to be transferred um, is a huge part of the business model, if you will, of how this is done. You know, I'd like to talk with Matthew Robertson here. I know you're coming in uh, from Australia with us. Um, Mr. Robertson, you're working on uh, a number of studies, your most recent execution by organ procurement. We just talked about DNA here. Um, you documented in your, uh, through the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in 2020 that Chinese authorities have been building a DNA database largely of the male population. We have some folks here in the audience here in Washington who are still looking for family members associated with this. Is it fair to say not only is this the largest police-run DNA database in the world, but there is a concerted effort to identify and track all men in the country in this type of uh, roundup? Thank you for your question. Um, it's the scale of that program, um, yes, is very extensive, and it was almost um, – not known about until an enterprising investigator began looking at a large scale at Chinese media reports. It's unclear what the purpose of that was. It does appear to have been a campaign to gather DNA data on males across the country. Um, the connection with that and the organ trade is unclear. Uh, it's not clear that there is any connection. But I want to touch on a point that you made about uh, the complicity of Western um, corporations with this industry in China. And uh, I think it's fair to say that Western companies and institutions, you know, healthcare, um, you know, hospitals, medical centers have been instrumental in the rise of China's organ transplantation industry. I can just give you a couple of examples. So Roche, it's a Swiss company. I mean, it has a US financial presence. They built the first organ registry for the PLA uh, in the early 2000s. Um, some of the other drug companies have been sponsors of Chinese, the Chinese official transplant associations. And they've funded research by Chinese uh, surgeons during a time where there were no voluntary transplants. Um, and this is not even to mention extensive training, at least hundreds of Chinese surgeons who have engaged in organ trafficking have been trained in the United States. Um, so the Chinese transplant industry simply could not have capitalized on the, you know, the incarcerated population of political prisoners without gaining the know-how from the West. Um, this is something that, you know, ha has already happened and we need to, you know, study it, investigate it, understand actually the dimensions of that contact. Um, but there could still be ongoing um, 
you know, ties, money being made, um, and things that can be done now. So I think the first step is understanding what has happened and then um, stopping it to the extent that it continues. Mr. Robinson, if such an investigation were to be taken, particularly into how the West has intentionally or unintentionally emboldened the harvesting of organs from China, would you have recommendations for this commission that we could take um, for both the investigation piece and to be able to do that fact-finding mission as you've done on the DNA side? Yeah, so uh, one idea, just a, a, a starter, is an audit of what the NSF and the NIH have funded um, and whether money has gone as sub-grantee, probably not as the, as the principal awardee, but as sub-awardee, um, to any of the many hundreds, nearly 1,000 hospitals in China that have engaged in organ trafficking. Um, so these are some of the biggest hospitals in China, biggest healthcare centers. It would be almost surprising if um, NIH money has not gone to them. So that should be accounted for. Um, there's also going to be training at taxpayer-funded medical centers across the United States. Uh, so the Cleveland Clinic is certainly one. Um, now, so some of these are going to be private and some of them are going to be public, but there may be uh, records requests that could be lodged with these institutions and uh, Congress could put some muscle behind getting them to look through their databases because they'll have this information in an archive somewhere about who has come from China and received what training. And so, you know, as part of an investigation that could be put together with our data sets of uh, you know, transplant surgeons and entities in China from this data set of medical publications and our cache of surgeon biographies. So we can put together on the U.S. side, you know, when they came, what training they received and then their activities in China, you know, what transplants they participated in prior to 2015, let's say. And then you could get a picture of what has the complicity of um, of U.S. institutions been. I mean, there's much more. There's you know, there's visa bans. I mean, the most kind of provocative suggestion I've made is actually using the SDN list. Um, so you know, the same kind of way that you know Iranian nuclear physicists are treated, where just there's no financial ties, no U.S. ties at all, um, no, you know, export control in the works, so the blocked persons list. That would be kind of the most, um, the most stringent or extreme response that the U.S. government could engage in. But if we're going to kind of buy the story that's being told here about the gravity of these abuses, that would seem perfectly warranted. Um, but I understand that would be a, a huge process, uh, but certainly, I think it'd be worth worth considering. And in principle, there's nothing preventing the U.S. government from doing that if it so wish. You've laid out a compendium, I think, that we should all look at. I asked the rest of the panel, but I mean, things that are immediately concerning. One, that we have U.S. taxpayer dollars knowingly going to potentially thousands of hospitals inside China that would be harvesting these organs. I think it's secondly safe to say that it's not just China alone that is benefiting from this practice. We have seen time and time again that others, particularly those in the West, are benefiting from this harvesting of organs. And then three, to your point, that the facilities and the medical professionals who have been trained here in the West, under the aegis of the medical code and Hippocratic Oath, are then being used as instruments of either the state or with knowing negligence to then harvest their fellow countrymen is beyond the pale. Uh, I'd like to open it up to the panel. Are there other recommendations that you would have here, either on the DNA mapping program that China is undertaking, or two, in holding the actual institutions accountable within China who are doing this harvesting accountable, what we can do on this side of the Pacific? Can I make a very quick suggestion on this? One thing I wanted to mention uh, just very quickly was that uh, Matt I talked about uh, uh, Roche, and you know, it's interesting that Roche was doing testing, of course, of its uh, immunosuppressive drugs in China, and it was using, China's a very cheap place to do that kind of testing. Uh, you've got a big population of people who 
received an organ. Uh, but those organs were coming from Falun Gong, in some cases, undoubtedly, especially at that time when Roche was doing this in the early 90s. It is also true that Pfizer got involved in that as well. Uh, uh, Pfizer did testing in China. They seemed to truncate their testing program, or at least try to do it as quickly as possible, because it was a controversial idea at that time. This is 2007, something like that. Uh, but I think it's really worth looking at the immunosuppressive industry, because this is, uh, people were killed to, to allow people to test in China. I think that's a really unethical idea. Uh, I'd mention one other thing. And I don't know how, where, how this falls into a category of how American policy could affect it, but okay, that's you, for you guys to figure out to some extent. But here's a real problem of the spillover from China, which is, and I get this from David Matus, he says, in Busan, Korea, at a symposium in November 2022, the first Asian Organ Donation International Symposium, this was in uh, Korea, China, and Japan, uh, and I've looked at the records for that, and a couple of the speakers talk about replicating the Euro transplant system, that is to say a cross-border allocation of organ donations. Uh, the speakers showed absolutely no awareness uh, that such a system would be the allocation to Japan and Korea of organs sourced from prisoners of conscience in China killed for their organs. Now, this is a classic case of, of as I say, of normalization of deviance. It's exactly what China wants. Their system of reform that they have always touted has really been about that. It's about saying, it's not about reforming themselves, it's about putting these systems in so that other people are doing them too, so the Chinese will feel okay about it or whatever. Uh, so this is, a, uh, the, the, the evidence is going that way. And that is, it seems to me, is one of the most important boils to lance here. I'm not quite sure how to do it. But I know the ISHLT thing is, is very helpful on that, but obviously maybe, they, maybe just even some explicit language from the U.S. government on this would help a lot. Dr. Leverson, did you have a follow-up on that? Yes, sir, Commissioner. I Sorry. You know, we're in the natural resources uh, hearing room, as I understand it, and, and I think, you know, the simplest answer to your question, which is the approach we took in Texas, is you're not going to stop the supply. Um, and I think it's important to understand that, that in, in its clearest form, uh, a, a communist government, whether it's China or another government, looks at a human being not as an individual with inalienable rights, but as a natural resource. And so if that can be monetized for the benefit of the uh, collective good, um, you're never going to stop that unless you can choke off the demand. And so that's the approach that we took in Texas. And that's what I'm here today uh, urging you to do is aggressively stop the flow of dollars from uh, Americans to China and other countries paying for these procedures. If nobody wants the organs, then they'll stop taking them. I think that is probably one of the most salient recommendations that we can have is that holding folks accountable outside of China as well as identifying the threat coming from inside China. It is a two-tier approach that we need to take comprehensively. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what I'd like to do going forward as well is to come up with a list of recommendations that could be actioned by communities of jurisdiction um, to be able to address this, both holding China accountable on the international scene, particularly those doing business with those thousand plus medical institutions operating in China, but then equally holding ourselves and our allies accountable for the export market that has proven so lucrative for the destruction of human life inside China. With that, I yield back the remainder of my time and I thank the Commissioner. Commissioner Nunn, thank you. And as always, thank you for your very well-informed and incisive questioning, but also your recommendations. And we will work with you on all of that. Thank you so very much.